All right, today we have another episode from the archives with one of my incredible guests. Enjoy. Welcome to the Trauma Therapist Podcast, a show about the incredible people dedicated to helping those who've experienced trauma. My name is Guy McPherson, and my mission is to raise the awareness of trauma and to inspire each of us to help those around us. All right, so welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. And again, if this is your first time joining us, this is a podcast where we're really reaching out and talking to individuals who have been in the field of trauma for years, who've made uh, you know significant contributions, who are masters, and really passionate about helping other individuals. Today, I am very excited to introduce my guest, Seaburn Fisher. Seaburn, are you ready to go? I am ready to go. All right. Seaburn Fisher has integrated neurofeedback and psychotherapy in her treatment of developmental trauma in adults and adolescents for the past 17 years. Uh, Prior to adopting neurofeedback, Seaburn was the clinical director of a residential treatment program for severely disturbed adolescents for 15 years. While there, she introduced the understanding of the impact of attachment rupture and was the first to implement DBT in a residential setting. In April, she published her book, Neurofeedback in the Treatment of Developmental Trauma, Calming the Fear-Driven Brain with Norton. Uh, She consults and trains on the integration of neurofeedback and therapy, both nationally and internationally. All right, Seaburn, just obviously a little bit about you. Take a moment before we get going here and share with our listeners just a a little something personal about yourself, perhaps where you're calling from, and uh, then we'll dive in. Well, um, I got into the field of trauma um, probably... Primarily, although without much awareness of this at the time, because of my own uh, significant trauma history, um, I had avoided um, becoming a psychotherapist because uh, when I was a kid, a 20-year-old in a in a uh, hospital, um, every single person, every single patient was going to become a psychotherapist. Uh, I took a different route, um, ended up working in implementation of family planning and realized as I was working with people in the family plan, you know, who would come in for um, either crisis counseling or regular um, contraceptive counseling that many of them um, uh, were coming at a time of crisis and uh, that there was very little that I was trained to do to help them. So I went and got a master's degree and then shift my, shifted my focus into working with, with uh, people with significant uh, histories of, of developmental trauma. This um, term now being used, I think, increasingly widely to describe people affected from the time they are very young by um, very challenging and threatening circumstances in their own homes. So that's how I got into it. Okay. And um, we're going to get into that uh, a little bit later. So you're, you're calling from Massachusetts? I am call, I'm calling from Western Massachusetts. My practice is in Northampton. Nice. Okay. So let's transition, uh, Seaburn. You know, we start off with a, a quote here, a mantra. This podcast is about really getting to know you, what's inspired you and driven you. Um, in order to do that, share with us uh, either a quote or a mantra or something that's kind of inspired you in this journey. I've thought about this, um, and I probably there have been different mantras over the course of my life. Um, but the, the central one is, is actually a quote from my first, I'm a Buddhist meditator, and from my first uh, Buddhist teacher, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, it was the very first thing that I heard him say in person. Um, he got up on a stage, and this is in Plum Village at his retreat center in France, and he, it was a a retreat for therapists and for traumatized vets from Vietnam. And he said, um, we fall back into the past, we jump ahead into the future, 
And in this, we lose our entire lives. And I think that that quote um, stays with me. It is true. Uh, and it is, it's true, I think, for most of us. But I think it is particularly true for um, people with histories of trauma. So, first of all, I love Thich Nhat Hanh, and we're going to link him up in the show notes page. And, and secondly, this is uh, an amazing quote. And it sounds like an, um, a phenomenal uh, workshop you went to there oh, it at was. Plum Village. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It sounds like perfect. But so we fall back into the past, we jump ahead into the future, and in this, we lose our entire lives. So, Seaburn, um, drop down a little. To, when did this become resonant for you? Well, I think it became resonant immediately. I was struck by that. And I think the whole audience of, of uh, vets and, you know, probably a, a fair represent, representation of trauma survivors, uh, even among those who were not vets, um, and you know, people who maybe had not had either of those experiences uh, felt that very deeply. And my one of the ways that I conceptualize my work or my duty, really, is to um, help people gain the present. Mm. Uh, trauma survivors, almost to a person, live in, in the past. They are caught in the past. Um, the, uh, they are driven by fear circuits in their brains. And those fear circuits, the amygdala being central to that, um, keep them, uh, has no, the, the amygdala has no time stamp on it. So whatever was ever dangerous to you will continue to be dangerous to you until you can work that through. And that's the trap that traumatized people are in. So this is a, um, this guides my work today and it, it, it guides my practice, my own personal practice as well. Mm -hmm. I love that. So my duty is to help people gain the present. And of course, as you said, many, you know, traumatized individuals kind of live in the past. And I'm really excited to, uh, as we move on here in this interview, I'll uh, hear you share about how you work with individuals to, um, you know, gain the present in a sense. Um, moving on, you know, we, at the, at the onset here, you talked a little bit about how you got into the specialization of trauma. Let's kind of focus in and put a magnifying glass on that topic right now. You know, this podcast again is about highlighting your journey people get into this field for a number of reasons you know you and I were talking before we started recording about my experience with my brother coming back from Iraq and uh, with PTSD and I just wanted to find and I was just so excited about talking to him getting uh, to hear about his experiences in, in the seals and just pestering him you know I, I keep using that word because that's what it is and and it, as I talk about it, I'm ashamed to say that, but that's what I did. And, you know, part of doing this podcast is, is hopefully coming back and uh, correcting that. But break, break it down for us, Seaburn. You know, what, what led you into, into this field of trauma? Well, um, perhaps in a similar but more direct way, it was personal. Um, I spent, um, I have a history of developmental trauma. I spent some time, some considerable time as a young adult in um, different mental institutions. And I spent um, a lot of time in, uh, in psychotherapy. And the, the whole time really, um, I, I benefited uh, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, from uh, the therapeutic relationships that I had and, and, um, uh, and from the skills that I learned um, uh, in terms of affect regulation. But I was always, at some level, limbically driven. And that was true, and that is true, 
uh, I think almost by definition, for people who have uh, suffered from uh, developmental trauma. Uh, and clearly from PTSD, that's what's going on. It is becomes a fear-driven brain. And it was only, um, uh, so I've been doing this for 35 years, and it was only um, uh, in the, um, as you said, about 17 years ago, that I started to focus on the brain at all. I had been trained, as most psychotherapists are, to focus on issues of the mind and how the mind is formed uh, by its history, which is true, and its environment and the impacts of trauma, the impacts of everyday life. Um, and uh, had no training in my graduate education, and I should say this is still mostly true, on how the uh, functioning of the brain uh, contributes to the dilemma, much less any real approach to how treating or working with the brain could help, because the only approach to working with the brain of trauma survivors and of any anybody who's significantly mentally ill so far has been uh, working with uh, 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 psychopharmacology. And in the last um, 30 years, with the major advances or, or, or the use of, of psychopharm, there have been there, the statistics do not show that this has actually been a helpful approach uh, to the treatment of mental illness. So we were really looking for a new way, although I have a story. I mean, my story about how I got into this field is, is hardly one of, of seeing the light immediately. I had to do this training myself, what, which we're calling neurofeedback, which is called neurofeedback, um, to have any... Uh, idea of its usefulness, mm -hmm. particularly its usefulness for people with trauma. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we want to hear that story. You want me to, you want to talk about it right now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, I had a, co a colleague, uh, a woman named Kathy Zilberman who, um, and I was having, uh, dinner with her. I was then the clinical director of a treatment center, as you mentioned, for severely disturbed adolescents, most of whom would age out of the program not a whole lot better once they got out. They would do better in the containment of the, of the residential program and with therapy. But once they got out, they were, or most of them would sort of fall apart. Very few went on to live constructive and healthy and, and good lives, and I think for exactly the reasons that we're going to discuss um, in our conversation. Um, anyway, so I had a, a, a dinner with Kathy, and she started telling me about this thing that she was looking into called neurofeedback, um, and told me that I could teach these kids, that these kids could learn um, behavioral control by playing a video game with their brains. And I just looked at her. I had absolutely no uh, understanding of, of uh, how this could be possible. I didn't know much about the brain, but it also, this was a time way before there was any conversation about circuits running the show in the brain, which is now more and more uh, what people are uh, discussing. But there was no discussion of that then. And we are, with neurofeedback, appealing to the circuits in the brain, the way the brain fires. So I uh, was I agreed to um, become her first uh, subject. And um, I, we did a couple of sessions, and I got headaches. I was a migrainer, among many things that have resolved with neurofeedback. I was a migrainer, and uh, I got a migraine, um, but nothing, nothing much seemed to happen. So she was frustrated, as I, and she said, well, let's just, we decided we'd just do this for a weekend. I usually caution people here that this is not a recommendation, but this is how I got into the field. So I did about over at her house about 
oh, maybe seven or eight hours of neurofeedback training um, uh, in, at a particular frequency for, um, uh, you know, over the weekend. And I, 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 after I left, I, I did have a migraine the first day, a really bad migraine, and still something said to me, go back and have, get more. So I, I did. The migraine was pretty bad. I went, I, there was a movie that I was going to miss if I didn't see it. It was, had a, a certain level of violence in it. I walked out of the movie almost to the point of being sick from the violence, which is stuff that is sort of de rigueur in movies, um, not that exceptional. Walked home, noticed what is often called the clean windshield effect, where I just, uh, every, um, all the light was beautiful. It was just turning dark, that, that beautiful um, uh, blue uh, lights coming on in people's windows. It was an exquisite experience. I could feel the, the air on my skin in a new way. I was vibrant. And um, uh, and perhaps even vibrating. <clears throat> so I, uh, she called me, uh, Kathy called me on Monday. That was on a Sunday. She called me on Monday night and I was hypomanic and I was... Um, I had a bad migraine, and my speech was quite pressured. And she was really nervous, which was understandable since I was her very first patient. Um, and I said to her, as I mentioned, a Buddhist meditator, so was she, and I said, uh, Kathy, um, I am one with everything. And she, of course, that just made her even more nervous because I was saying this with a in, with pressured speech in a hypomanic way. Um, and I said, no, I understand why you're nervous. I can hear my own voice. I know why you're worried. This is going to be over on Wednesday morning. I had no idea how I knew that. Um, and on Wednesday morning, the whole thing lifted. Now, th there is a there is an experiential explanation for that, um, but I wouldn't have known it. I was I went into this not believing in it at all, and now as I got clearer on my experience in Western non-Dharma terms, I realized that what had happened is that I had um, the background level of ambient fear that I lived in uh, all the time, twenty four seven was greatly reduced. And uh, so it, you know, it was very clear to me that this is something that I had to do uh, and in um, that I had to learn more about this. And so I went and I got training and the only place it was available at that point was in California. <clears throat> I went and studied with two um, very bright uh, neurofeedback people and um, and then began to incorporate it into my practice uh, slowly, uh, but with with very um, great benefit, particularly for people where fear, shame, and rage are primary. Wow. So thank you so much for sharing that story. I mean, that is an incredible story. You're sitting down there having dinner with your friend, Kathy. She talks about neurofeedback and, you know, you're like, what are you talking about? You, in fact, go through that training yourself. What, what specifically did she have you do? Well, I, um, neurofeedback, it's a little hard to describe on the radio or in a blog, but, um, it is a, uh, it's a process where, uh, there are sensors placed on your scalp that pick up your EEG and you place them, you place the sensors depending on assessment. So the right hemisphere is where affect regulation takes place. And so for me, we were looking at um, right hemisphere training, just lowering arousal in general. If you were somebody who had uh, whose arousal is too low, and I have a story to tell you about that too, then uh, you, you would, um, this is, these are general 
assumptions, you know, are always going to be true. But you would place the uh, sensor on the left. And then you, you, you're looking at a, uh, you're picking up the person's uh, real time EEG. So their brainwave signature of their brain at that place, at that moment in time. And you're deciding on what frequency would help make this person, in my case, calmer. And um, so we know, for instance, that alpha is considered a relaxing frequency. So what you can dial in, you can dial alpha into your um, computer. And every single time I make alpha, in this case, I was re, uh, I could be rewarded to make it. The problem for me was that I was um, the only frequency that was available then that was considered calming because of of, of uh, research done in epilepsy was uh, 12 to 15 hertz, and f- which is called SMR. So, so she dialed, uh, but, well, all she had was available to her at that moment in time was 12 to 15 hertz. So I trained at 12 to 15 hertz, and um, it was too high. And that's why I was manic. <clears throat> and um, and with pressured speech and probably contributed significantly to the migraine as well. So now you can dial in any frequency with the system that I use. You can even change it by an eighth of a hertz. Um, and so you can pinpoint what frequency is the most calming to this individual and uh, and what placement is best for this individual. Neither the placement nor the frequency was absolutely right for me, but nonetheless, I had this extraordinary experience. And all it is is inform- the, the, the electrical signal from my brain is amplified 10,000 times, goes into the computer, the computer reads it, and then it sends that, that to a video game, and I'm playing a video game just with by changing brainwaves. Every single time I, I happen upon, in this case, 12 to 15 hertz, I get a reward. And the brain just naturally goes after what it's rewarded to do. Uh-huh. And even, it's not conscious. You, you, you know, you, but you, every time you do it and you, and you, you're also having to exercise some control over things that you shouldn't be making, like slow wave or excess fast wave. And when you do all of those at once, you get um, you get a reward, and your brain just goes for that. So that's 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 what she did with me, and that's uh, that's what I do with my my patients wow. as well. And you said you had a story about the too low arousal. Yeah, I mean that's not usually who I work with, but one of the early, um, one of my very early experiences. So I'd just been out to training, and it was recommended that you don't um, uh, train your patients right away. And I strongly endorse this recommendation, but you train families, family and friends. <clears throat> but it was set up in my my waiting room, <clears throat> and I had a patient who had a, a history of. Uh, monopolar, severe monopolar depressions. And her sister had died of, uh, had died as a result of suicide with bipolar. So she was at some considerable risk. She came in, she was crying, and she said, I have dropped into this depression so fast that it's terrifying to me. And I hadn't seen it before. We had talked about it. We had talked about ways of managing it, should it reoccur, but I hadn't seen it. And the system was sitting there and she said, I'm not going to take medications. My, I can't teach when I'm like this. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't do anything but, but uh, be in bed. Please, please try this uh, neurofeedback. So I agreed to it. And I did what I had been told, which is with uh, with low arousal, <clears throat> um, when you want to raise arousal, you put the sensor on the left hemisphere and train at 15 to 18 hertz. That was the other available frequency in the early uh, days of neurofeedback. So I trained her for 
um, 30 minutes uh, at 15 to 18, and I just watched her in just change over the course of the of the session. Now, this is something that she had lived with for her entire adult life since adolescence, actually. Um, and in one session, we saw it remediate. I trained her for 23 sessions altogether. And um, 12 years after, is, and, and then she stopped. And I had reason to give her a follow-up call um, 12 years later. I was, uh, I was taking a, a trip, and she, she knew the area I was going to. And she said, well, you can tell your audiences that I have had no reoccurrence of depression since neurofeedback. She said, I have had moments, I've had mo- mornings when I wake up a little blue, but it's nothing that a cup of coffee or meditation doesn't take care of. So that was a very encouraging start for me, you know, in terms of what neurofeedback could do. All right. Um, I don't know if you follow me on Instagram or not, but when I do interviews, I usually do two interviews a week. I conduct two interviews a week. And usually I, I get so excited. I get so pumped up after these interviews because I get to talk to incredible people. And what I usually do is I go on Instagram and I, I talk about it. I, I want to share that excitement. Usually there's a, about a two month turnaround on my podcast, which means that um, they don't go live for a couple of months. And I have a problem with that um, because I, ju- I want to share it. I get so excited about these things. So what I've done is I've created a um, a membership called Trauma Therapist Plus and it allows people for $5 a month to access these episodes about two months before they get published to the public. And you can also listen ad-free, which is really cool. So if you're interested in that, if you're interested in uh, listening to episodes before they get released to the general public and also listening ad-free, check it out. Um, You can access it by going to Apple Podcasts and just clicking on any of the episodes that has a plus, P-L-U-S, before it. Um, It's exciting. I'm excited about it. And you'll also help support the podcast. Um, Thank you so much for being a listener. I, I really appreciate it. Take care. I should say, my God, these stories are phenomenal. I mean, just really. Yeah, and, and now let me just say, too, it's very important that I say that that is the kind of thing where you feel you're very lucky to have. Because if I had had a patient that is more typical with depression, it, it doesn't go like that. It's slower. It's you have to look around more for frequencies. You mm-hmm. have to, you know, it's harder. Mm-hmm. But it was just a very encouraging um uh, first case for me, and she was li- she was truly my first case. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's really interesting to hear you talk about your own experience, you know, and how this impacted you, and that uh, then inspired you to begin studying this and using this with your clients. I mean, that just uh, is, is really inspiring, Seaburn. I want to thank you for sharing that. So, you know, we talked a little bit about your journey, Seaburn, what got you into this field. Now, share share with the listeners here. Um, you know, an early clinical error you made and what you learned from that. Obviously, uh, you know, people uh, use this word differently, error, mistake. Some people don't like to look at it that way, but share with our listeners something, uh, you know, that you experienced and the lessons you've learned. Well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's everything that I did early on um, and I have no problem embracing mistakes. Um, you know, I have this bifurcated career. I have the before neurofeedback and the after neurofeedback. And I would say that the biggest mistake that I made was working with people. This is before um, I learned about neurofeedback. Uh, was working with people with dissociative identity disorder uh, or multiple personality disorder and um, a 
pushing, maybe something like you were doing with your brother, pushing for them to reveal uh, their trauma, which just is overwhelming to people who have uh, somehow survived the level of horror that these um, people have survived. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And so... uh, you know, but it was it was seen as what was necessary in trauma was for people to say it. Um, right. Now there's much, even without neurofeedback, there's a lot of of uh, focus on stabilizing um, before you begin to talk about trauma, um, and these uh, these patients are. Um, um, really across the board it's very difficult to stabilize and I think you know it's because of the very things we're talking about is they are absolutely overridden by fear and um, to, to such a great extent and so early in their lives that they have fragmented so I think that if I were if, if you know to, to young therapists who find themselves working with these severe disorders stabilizing first is the most important thing to do. So you talked about this bifurcated career. How long had you been working uh, in the field before you began utilizing uh, neurofeedback? About equal amount of time now. So I had been doing uh, uh, psychotherapy. I began um, as a, you know, I was the the clinical director of the residential treatment center in that I often took the most challenging cases. Um, and that was right after I finished graduate school in 79. I think I started there in 79 and worked there for 15 years and then had a, or 17 years, I think, and then had a private practice um, after that. And I would have brought neurofeedback into that because I was learning about it at the end of my tenure there uh, had that been acceptable but it it, it was too new and it was too uh, controversial I think now interestingly the residential treatment centers in my area there there are two for kids both of uh, both of them use neurofeedback so you know it's it's uh, it's just an irony really yeah so um, you know, now we get to one of my favorite questions, Seaburn, which is, you know, why, you know, we, we talked about some of the challenges of the specialization, what got you here. For me, I just really find it interesting exploring why we do what we do. I mean, that answer, in a sense, drives us along, uh, you know, in our work, in our passion. You know, this is a little different than what got you here in the first place, but share with us, you know, why you keep doing this day to day. Well, you know, it's not uh, clear to me, uh, Guy, why, uh, not, not why I do it. Why I do it is, is clear, and I think we've talked some about it. But um, if I'd still be doing it, if it weren't for um, being able to help people regulate this wild affective realm, with with neurofeedback because it's 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 terribly terribly wearing on the patient but it's also very wearing on the therapist and so i'm not at all sure that i'd continue to be in this or look forward actually to my work which i do greatly uh if i didn't have that modality on board so it's it's because you're able to help people regulate their affect in a sense you're able to yeah yeah and yeah which which is very difficult to do um uh with um talk therapy and there's reasons for that in the architecture of the brain but it's very difficult to do that with talk therapy insight oriented therapy um probably the least useful and ultimately it's even in in standard therapies it's not the talk Uh, so much as it is the state of the therapist. Um, And when you work with severely dysregulated people, it can be very difficult to stay regulated in that encounter. So not only do I 
think that neurofeedback is very helpful for the trauma patient. I think it's very helpful for the uh, trauma therapist. So I, I love what you said there. It's not so much the talk, but the state of the therapist. Say a little more, more about that and the importance of that. Well, we're, think, we're thinking about this as a regulating other, that the therapist has to be able to stay in her own skin, uh, in, in, a, in a state of relative calm, although calm is not always called for, but at least if it's not calm, that it's thought out what you're, uh, what you're, um, how you're going to be with your patient. It is really an overall abiding relationship because it is the only thing that quiets the um, the ner- the state of the of the patient is is if you are um, y- yourself relatively well put together and and um, with them mm-hmm. um, and it's not so much how clever you are how much you understand of the patient's dilemma although of course that's very important but. Mostly, I think it has to do with, um, you know, how contained and containing you can be of, of, of a wild affective experience uh, on the part of the patient. And if you can't, uh, if their affect wins the day, then the therapy fails. Because first and foremost, that's what all therapies need to achieve is affect regulation. And I, I just think it's so interesting that you, you're bringing this up because it, it comes up again and again as I talk to, uh, you know, the, the other individuals I've talked to, and it's it's this the state of the therapist, and maybe it's not surprising, but in this day and age where you know we as therapists um, have a plethora of workshops and interventions and modalities to choose from. Um, it, it almost becomes uh, uh, the case of the bright, shiny object. You know, well, let me do this and let me do that and let me do that. Mm-hmm. And what it keeps coming back to again and again, Seaburn, from these interviews, uh, again, not surprisingly, but just so poignantly, is that so much of this depends upon us as clinicians. And as you're saying here, the state of the therapist. And why, why is that difficult? Why is it difficult for us as clinicians, as therapists, to to have that abiding uh, presence or relationship that you're talking about? Well, it's very challenged by um, threats, threats that that, that um, uh, dysregulated patients make on themselves, um, uh, to you, to the therapy. Um, it's, uh, if, uh, if there's screaming, if there's a good deal of, of, of crying and, um, although one of my colleagues said that, you know, when I asked him if he had seen the movie, the crying game, he said, I, I have, that's what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it's, it, but it's, it's difficult. It's mm-hmm. difficult for us as human beings to sit with um, uh, really, really uh, intense affect, yeah. emotion. Um, and it's no different being a therapist that that's difficult to sit with. Uh, desperation, um, uh, severe depression, hopelessness. And it's hour after hour that you're sitting with that in with one person or another that's what's different in the, the way that I do my work now because I really target that uh because I can um I don't just sit with it I t- that becomes the focus of our work with brain regulation you know see when many of the listeners here um are experienced. Uh, some have been doing this work for, for many years. Some are just getting into the field of trauma. Some, some therapists have been working, uh, and really don't realize that they've been working with individuals who have been traumatized. 
But sh- you know, you've been do- obviously doing this for a while. What advice would you have for individuals who are just beginning their uh, education into trauma informed treatment? Well, um, it's not going to surprise you, given the the, t- the tenor of what we've talked about so far. But I think that in most graduate programs, there is much too little training um, education about the brain, and that for the, the we we had, I think, at the end of the last century, what was called the decade of the brain. Well, I think we're in the century of the brain, and that there's been this disconnect between the brain and the mind that it produces. I mean, the brain is the infrastructure of mind and we keep, we keep trying to deal with it's the, the way that it gets manifest in, in, in emotion and in thought distort disorders or distortions. So, um, for new therapists, uh, coming on and for therapists who really realize they're up against something, uh, in treating trauma, I would recommend that they begin uh, to uh, understand that the brain is plastic, that we have access to that plasticity, and that we have that through um, biofeedback, which is uh, neuro, but, but neurofeedback, um, which is, as I described it before, it's a computer-based interface which gives information on the frequency at which your brain fires, and it, you can shift the way that you feel. You can shift the way that you think and you can shift the way that you behave. And the vast majority of people who are, are, who are wildly dysregulated or even somewhat dysregulated don't want to live in that dysregulation. So it's not hard to get an alliance around this. So for young therapists going into this and that they won't have to overcome the, the, um, the, the technophobia that I had to overcome is they're all, they all know the computer. To learn a computer uh, uh, brain interface uh, called neurofeedback, it will be of, of, of great benefit to them and to their patients. Okay. So get educated about the brain, understand the brain's elastic and that we can you know, access and optimize that via neurofeedback and biofeedback. Um, Let's shift to two book recommendations. And for, at, at, before we do, I just want to say that, um, you know, for those listeners who aren't aware, you were, uh, Seaburn, really kind of prominently featured in uh, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. And uh, uh, that was, I thought, a, a really great uh, highlight of, of, you know, you and the work you do. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, so share with us, uh, two books that have inspired you, influenced you, and they don't necessarily have to be trauma-related books. And then we're going to talk about your book. Well, they happen to be trauma-related books. Um, probably the two most important books that I've read in my field are Bessel's. Uh, one is Bessel's book, uh, Traumatic Stress. And the other is, was Alan Shore's book on affect regulation and the origin of self. So those two books, um, there have been other books in the neuroscience realm that have been very influential or perhaps even more validating than influential. But in terms of, of uh, coming to understand um, the nature of the attachment rupture and the, the, the effects that it has on the brain, those were the, those were the two most important books for me. Okay. So Bessel van der Kolk's book, um, Traumatic Stress, and Alan Shore's book, we'll have links to those both on the show notes page at westcoasttraumaproject.com. Um, Seaburn, your book uh, that just recently came out, Neurofeedback and the Treatment of Developmental Trauma, Calming the Fear-Driven Brain. Um, share with us a bit about what your thoughts were um, you know, on putting this work together. Um, well, it, it, let me say that I, I had been encouraged by my husband, among other people, to write a book, um, but I didn't have an intention to do so until I got a letter from Norton asking me if I would, would write a book on, on attachment disorder and neurofeedback. And I, I, I gather that they had been, you know, reading um, my stuff on the Internet um, so uh, it was 
um, it was the impetus of Norton uh, that got me to do this book. Um, I made the what seemed uh, that, that became an audacious promise to do this book in two years which I in fact did. Um, and again, I have to credit brain regulation for this, which I still <laughs> train my brain fairly regularly. This is a big endeavor. I was doing it along at the same time as I was doing my clinical work. Um, I also have to thank my patients who were um, articulate about what the gains had been for them. And I had been writing about it and trying to understand it, particularly in the realm of quieting fear. So, um, uh, you know, I just, uh, I struggled, I think, like all authors do with, with, it's a very daunting process, but I'm more than I ever knew, would have known before I did it. Um, but it, it seems to me to be an important book and it's important. Yeah. I, I liked that phrase of bright, shiny object. I, I don't want neurofeedback to become a bright, shiny object. I want it, I want it to be understood as an, as a portal into the very nature of how we are as human beings, which is that we are plastic, we can make these changes, and there is this relatively crude um, device or, or system instrument that allows you to, to do that. And any human being can, can do that with, it, with uh, the proper training. And, and I, I always recommend that people do neurofeedback, not on themselves, which was my fate, but um, in a psychotherapy relationship, because there's, it's, it is to me a relational technology. It isn't useful. I would, would say, you know, about Bobby Fischer, if he were to come to me and say, I want to become a better chess player, and I've had people come to me and say this, I would have said to Bobby Fischer, well, or I would have thought about Bobby Fischer that if I don't make him or allow him to become a better human being, then I failed him. And in becoming a better functioning human being, more relational human being, and that's really what I mean by that, you will become a better chess player. You will become a better skier. You will be, you will, you, peak performance is embedded in a relational self. So that's what I think neurofeedback allows us to, uh, to, to ultimately uh, gain mm -hmm. is that capacity for deep interpersonal relationship that is so abraded and um, upset in the process of trauma. So that's neurofeedback uh, and the treatment of developmental trauma, calming the fear driven brain. Again, that'll be linked up in the show notes. Um, Seaburn, what's the best way for individuals to, uh, to contact you? Uh, probably through my uh, email. Um, which is seaburn.fisher at verizon.net um, or they can visit my website uh, feardrivenbrain.com okay. so seaburn.fisher at verizon.net and the website is feardrivenbrain.com Seaburn I want to thank you so much um, really for you know sharing you, you know your personal story things that have gone on with you and I just loved the way you took the time to uh, talk to us about how you got into this whole field of neurofeedback and just, the, you know, your passion about helping people. And uh, it's, it's been awesome. So thank you again for, for taking the time to do this. Well, it's been my pleasure, uh, Guy. I've, uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. Okay. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.